the Vice Chancellor, mm -hmm. Professor Ramon Ebelo, mm -hmm. Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and Research, and the incoming Vice Chancellor. DBC Management Services, DBC Development Services, the Registrar, Provost College of Medicine of the University of Lagos, members of the Governing Council of the University of Lagos, the BOSA, my dean, dean of faculty of basic medical sciences, deans of other faculty present. Members of the Senate of the University of Lagos, the National and State Executives of Unilag Alumni, distinguished senators and honorable members of the House present, academic and non academic members of staff, members of the Fourth Estate, all invited guests, students of the University of Lagos. Today, the 8th of November 2017, to deliver the 14th inaugural lecture in this section of our great university, University of Lagos, University of First Choice and the Nature's Pride. This inaugural lecture is also the third in the Department of Anatomy of the University of Lagos since its establishment in 1962. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact that I am the third professor to deliver an inaugural lecture in the department after 55 years of its establishment is significant. It is a confirmation of one of the major challenges in the teaching of anatomy that I will address in the course of this presentation. That qualified anatomy are now globally endangered species. I therefore seize this great opportunity to pay homage to the two great anatomists that delivered their inaugural lectures before me. These are Professor Olada Koashiru, OFR, and Professor Abayomi Okonlawo, Senior Anatomist of Nigeria. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. The discipline of anatomy won my heart long ago when I was an undergraduate medical student at the University of Ibadan. People who are very familiar with medical school are quite aware that students dread anatomy the most among all courses. For me, however, there is an irresistible passion for all that anatomy entails. As an undergraduate medical student, I was a demonstrator already in the laboratory, a vocation I did with utmost passion, because anatomy had by then become my first love. <laughs> However, after the completion of my NYC program in 1990, I did what most people do with their first love, take them for granted. And I went into private practice. Mm -hmm. Then sometimes between late 1998 and early 1999, I started to have a very strong all to go back to my first love, the teaching of announcement. Unknown to me, however, my first love was also seeking me. And eventually, God used my old friend Dr. Mike Akikomi to bring the two lovers together. And a beautiful love story began. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, early this year, I had a great committee meeting in the office of the Dean of Postgraduate School. Present at that meeting were five profoundly senior colleagues of mine and myself. I remember Professor Soare throwing the challenge at me, AAA, you should do it very soon. In fact, you can do it this very year. Immediately I took up the challenge. 
And in two weeks, I came up not only with a topic, but with a date as well. And a few months afterwards, here I am today in the court of the Vice Chancellor, <laughs> giving testimonies and waiting to be discharged and acquitted. <laughs> I must confess, sir, that getting the topic was not easy. It took sleepless nights. What compounded my difficulty was the topic my boss, Professor Abayoni Okonlawon, had for his inaugural lecture, Beyond Anatomy. And I reasoned, if my boss had already gone beyond anatomy, I don't have a choice but to confine myself within anatomy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will be following this anatomical outline for the delivery of my inaugural lecture. Anatomy is about the richest and most interesting world humans have ever created in this world. The word literally means dissection, which means cutting off. However, anatomy as a discipline is the study of structure and form of an organism or part of it thereof. And how these explain the functions of the organism. Anatomy breaks barriers and crosses borders. Anatomy has a wide coverage and it's particularly fascinating to note how little the word anatomy changes no matter where you go in this world. Indeed, anatomy is everywhere, and everywhere is anatomy. There's always a coverage. For example, in English, Somali and Swahili, it is anatomy. In Dutch, French, and German, it is anatomy. In Latin, Portuguese, Italian, Polish, it is anatomy. In Russia, it is anatomy. In Japanese, Kabugadu. <laughs> in Chinese, Jipyoshu. In Yoruba, anatomy. And my coinage, finally, the first time in the world, in the Jebu language, anatomy. Eh? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Jack of all trades is a figure of speech used in reference to a person who has delved into many endeavors rather than focusing on just one. He or she is an effective and an efficient multitasker. The earliest recorded use of this word never contains the second clause, master of none, never. In this, sir, the earliest versions were profoundly positive. Such a jack of all trades is the master of integration. An individual who knows enough from many disciplines, from any endeavors, and can bring all together in one. Jack of all trades is a person who has many skills and is decent at everything. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I therefore submit to this great audience today that the phrase Jack of all trades, master of none, is contradictory, nonsensical. <laughs> Tautological and amounts to gross grammatical infelicity. Oh, yeah. It should, therefore, sir, not be used in an academic setting at least. You are here simply a jack or jack of all trades. You can never be both jack of all trades and at the same time the master of none. My choice, therefore, and topic is the anatomy, jack of all trades, master of none. Of all. I have decided and divided my contribution, sir, into 12 broad areas as shown. However, sir, the topic the anatomist, jack of all trades, master of all, is very wide. And because, sir, of time constraint, and since I will not, 
lying to be properly discharged and acquitted today without a fine. I will mention only a few in this oral presentation. But the rest assure, ladies and gentlemen, that all the details are in the written document before you and will be available on my website. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, chronobiology refers to anatomy in time. It is the biology of time and internal biological clocks. It is the scientific study of the effect of time on living systems and of biological readings. Rhythmicity is as old as mankind. The hormone or agent that is central to this is known as melatonin and is primarily produced by a tiny organ in the brain. My contributions in the field of chronobiology in 2002, we showed for the very first time, and conclusively for that matter, that the quantity of red blood cells in the blood exhibits variations in accordance with the time of the day, with peak values at 6 a.m. and lowest values at 12 noon. This may have great implications in the diagnosis and management of anemia and anemia-related diseases. Secondly, sir, Mr. Vice Chancellor, in 2003, we identified and characterized for the very first time the rhythm of blood glucose levels in our environment. This study demonstrated that blood glucose level in male rats in Lagos exhibit a rhythm with a peak at 7 p.m. and lowest value at 11 a.m. This may have far-reaching effects and consequences in the diagnosis and management of diabetes. For example, our findings may in no distant future affect the medical prescription in our environment. In 2006, we determined the effect of blindness on blood glucose level. Our results showed that blind rats had a reading too. However, their blood glucose levels were significantly lower than those of sighted animals. We concluded, therefore, that visual impairment may have implications in the management of diabetes. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. Indeed, life is a rhythm. Time to be a boy. Time to be a man. Time to be a student. And time to be a professor. Even time to get into the 11th floor and the time to leave the 11th floor. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, from my expertise and experience on chronobiology, I know that the life of everyone here before and after my lecture can never remain the same. Indeed, as basic and as simple as our eyes and weight, they can never be identical at the beginning and at the end. Sir, the rest assured, I am still in the realm of science and not metaphysics. <laughs> the, my contributions in the field of diabetology. In 2005, sir, the, the scientific basis for the use of bitter leaf and bitter cooler as blood glucose lowering agents were investigated and we were able to demonstrate that both plants actually possess anti-diabetic properties. In our quest for more anti-diabetic options, in 2005 again, we compared the anti-diabetic action of the African Brazil with some commonly used oral hypoglycemic agents, and it became very clear that the African Brazil, otherwise known as Ephine in Yoruba, has strong anti-diabetic effects, and we prove this scientifically, which may also be developed into a new plant medicine for the treatment of diabetes. In 2006, the anti-diabetic leaves, effects of the leaves of mistutu were investigated, and we showed that mistutu produced significant anti-diabetic effect comparable to most standard anti-diabetic drugs. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, this is probably the first scientific establishment of such effect. 
In 2008, we investigated the anti-diabetic property of the seeds of the African breadfruit and the potential of this seed in the prevention and reversal of the toxicity inflicted by diabetes on the testes. Our results show that African breadfruit seed could be a good adjunct in the treatment of diabetes and some of its complications. In 2014, my research team, Mr. Vice Chancellor, won a university grant to determine the safety of some of the commonly used oral hypoglycemic agents in pregnant diabetic crabs. As a consequence of the increased prevalence of type 2 diabetes in younger age groups, we are beginning to see a combination of diabetes and our pregnant women. Since many of our women are adverse to injections in pregnancy, the only option therefore left is the use of oral hypoglycemic agents. Unfortunately, the use of these drugs in pregnancy has raised a lot of concerns on the possibility of hazards to the baby. Another great concern frequently overlooked is what is known as trypanophobia, otherwise known as needlephobia. This affects about 10% of the population, and in extreme situations, it can lead to morbid fear of getting pregnant. A credible alternative to insulin therapy will therefore be of immense benefit to this large group of people. Moreover, sir, the use of oral hypoglycemic agents would alleviate the plight of many pregnant women with diabetes in our rural setup. These are the oral hypoglycemic agents that we tested, and these are the fetal parameters that we measured. For example, we measure the crown rump length, we measure the fetal weight, and we measure the placenta weight to determine toxicity. These are the hematological parameters that we tested, and we also tested the lipid profile and the liver function test. Some of the reproductive hormones were also tested and oxidative markers both in the mother and the amniotic fluid, including glutathione. Mr. Vice Chancellor, this is probably the most encompassing research in this field of diabetology undertaken by any single laboratory in the world, and it is taking place right in the university. Based on our preliminary observations, we have found that many of these oral hypoglycemic agents are relatively safe in the rats. However, further analysis, interpretation, and extrapolation of our data are ongoing. And in no distant future, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, instead of injections being given to our pregnant women, there could be some pills in the future. My contributions in the area of abology. Due to my interest in the development of treatment modalities of plant origin, I have worked on over 30 different plants to date, and 25 of them have been published. These plants include Vanonia amygdalina, Osimo gratisimio, Yacinia cola, Tapinantus butingiae, Momodica fetida, Trochella africana, Ajatica indica, Momodica sucifolia, Thessalium radiator, Sinogelum jonianum, Pigelia africana, Citrus paradise, Citrus abatifolia, Abrox dictatorius, Calotaros procera, Cocos nucera, Moringa olifera, Momodica charantia, Hibiscus abarifa, Longocapos sinensis, Cocoma longa, Limbodia livis, Mucuna pura, Tetraria occidentalis. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. Anyone that has worked extensively on several apps as this is eminently qualified to be a herbalist. <laughs> However, sir, to remove doubt as to whether I am still in the realm of science or not, I prefer the glorified time, abologist. My contribution, sir, in the field of reproductive endocrinology. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, 
In 2003, we provided the critical reference value of follicle stimulating hormone necessary for the production and maintenance of sperm in our environment for the first time. In 2003, we identified and characterized and established the critical range of the male hormone in our environment. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, to the best of our knowledge, we were the first to establish in 2004 that the so-called prostate-specific antigen correlates negatively with sperm count. In 2009, we demonstrated that over 70 percent of males and females in Lagos are producing antibodies against their own eggs. Our studies on these hormones and antigens and antibodies will greatly impact on the diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis of several conditions and challenges associated with conception. In 2009, we catalogued and characterized the impact of the environment on male fertility, and we noted with great concerns that the incidence of male infertility and cancers of the testes and prostate has increased significantly. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, we now have some evidence on the existence of male menopause. However, male menopause is unlike the female menopause in that the decrease in the male hormone and the development of symptoms are more gradual than that occurs in the women. Nonetheless, sir, about 30% of men in their 50s will experience symptoms of menopause. <laughs> this can be of great consequences in marriages, child rearing, and management of aging, especially where a considerable gap exists between the couple. My contribution, sir, in medical education. In 2010, we compared problem-based learning and lecture mode of learning among 300 level medical students. We found out that problem-based learning promoted better student participation in learning process, provided more learning form, ensured great students' participation and teamwork, and interpersonal skills acquisition, and enabled more students' critical thinking. We later evaluated the impact of problem-based learning and on 200-level pharmacy students, and our results were in tandem with what we had with the medical students. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, on the 25th of April 2014, at the 13th Annual General Meeting and Scientific Conference of the Society of Experimental and Clinical Anatomies, I presented a paper titled Transforming the Teaching of Anatomy, Biochemistry, and Physiology from Alacram Alapo to Lifelong Transformation Through Tales. This study highlighted the inherent challenges in the mode of teaching in most institutions based on retention and recall of knowledge. We found out that most of our students, under the traditional mode of teaching or the lecture mode, of teaching, make passing examinations the utmost goal, rather than understanding the subject. Most students cram and then pour back during the examinations, as a la cram a la poor. <laughs> Otherwise, known as back to sender. <laughs> From lecturer thou art come to lecturer thou shalt go back. <laughs> In continuation, sir, of my work on Alakram and Lapo, we publish a paradigm shift from traditional method of teaching to case based learning. In this work, we establish that the traditional modes of teaching focuses mainly on the transmission of content by disciplinary experts, and that institutions should consider the inclusion of case-based learning in their curricula to enhance 
development of critical thinking, creativity, self-directed and collaborative learning, which are the hallmark of knowledge transmission. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I am an advocate of e-learning at all levels. The advantages of e-learning are numerous, especially to those of us in sciences, where our laboratory facilities are currently overstretched. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, to demonstrate my passion for and commitment to medical education, I started to run an interactive website, now www.prof.org, solely for the students since September 2004. <laughs> All my lectures at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels are always on this platform, at least two weeks before my classroom interaction. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, all these materials are available to the students absolutely free. <laughs> this website continues to run till this very day. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I can assure you that in the next few years, sir, instead of our students saying, Google it, when they cannot find an answer, it will be Abraham. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, perhaps it was the benefits that this website has brought to numerous students. that in 2010, the students at the College of Medicine of the University of Lagos voted me as the lecturer with the greatest positive influence on the students. <laughs> at an occasion, 13th October 2010, that was marked with the presentation of this plan. Moreover, sir, on the 14th of April 2016, I presented the paper titled Case-Based Learning in the teaching of medical sciences at the Nelson Mandela School of Medicine, KwaZulu Natal University, South Africa. I've been invited here as a visiting scholar. The success of this presentation, sir, was so outstanding, bear their own rating, that a repeat invitation was immediately granted. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, my contributions on anatomical dissections and anatomical variations. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, anatomical variations are capable of influencing predisposition to diseases, clinical presentation and examination and investigation, and even management, including operative surgery. This realization, therefore, has informed our research team to invest in this field. A very good example is our study on palmaris lungus. A tiny muscle with a long tendon in the forearm, as shown. Although of little functional use, it assumes great importance when used as a donor tendon. The surgeon's awareness of its relative occurrence, therefore, is of immense benefit. We found, sir, in our study that as much as 13% of our individuals are lacking this muscle. The absence of this muscle in our study was found to be a lot higher than previously reported in other clients. It is possible, therefore, that at least two people on the head table are probably lacking for marriage longer. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, it is indeed truly entrenched in many constitutions of the world that all men and women are created equal. Well, maybe in spirit, we are. In fact, there is quite a large anatomical variation amongst fellow men and women. For instance, some have two primary slangles. Some have one, while some don't even have any.
Some have subclavius muscle running from the first rib down to the clavicle. Some don't have any. Some have just one. Some have two. In the neck, some have three lobes of the thyroid gland. Why? Some have two. Then also, 1% of our people have a rib in the neck. Why some have extra rib in the chest? <laughs> About 33% of our men and women have extra muscle in the thigh. There is a vessel on the dosum of the foot. We, so, a lot of studies done have shown that at least 10% of people are lacking this. All this, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, are beyond mere coincidences. They are not just coincidences. They are probably coded genetically. So the next time anyone claims that we are created equal, Please send the person to my library out loud. <laughs> my contributions in the field of contraception and contraceptives. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, in year 2001, we started to investigate the modulating roles of quinine on the testes. In fact, this is my PhD work. We have studied the short and long term consequences of quinine on the testes. And so far, we have published 10 scientific papers on this. We discovered that quinine has a deleterious effect on the testes and destructs spermatogenesis. We later investigated what could prevent and possibly reverse the adverse effects of quinine. And we explored testosterone and ascorbic acid. We conclusively demonstrated in 2004, 2005, 2007 that both these agents are capable of protecting against the quinine induced toxicity. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, our work on the effects of quinine on the testes of rats and rabbits has the potential of developing a non-invasive, non-steroidal, non-hormonal, and reversible, and an acceptable male contraceptive. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, this work is currently the most extensive study on the effects of quinine on the cytoarchitecture and morphometry of the testes ever conducted by any single laboratory in the world. In addition, our study has shown that quinine-induced testicular toxicity is an excellent animal model for the study of fertility and infertility. And this model has been quoted by several authors, as confirmed by Richard Gate in 2015 as one of the most cited papers in this field. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, in 2004, I won a grant from the International Society of Endocrinology to, pre to present part of this work at the 12th International Congress of Endocrinology in Portugal. Again, in 2008, at the 13th International Congress of Endocrinology, I presented a part of this work in here. And then in 2009, I won a grant from the American College of Endocrinologists to present part of this work once more in the United States of America. <laughs> My contributions in the area of stereology. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, stereology is a technique that enables acquisition of data on numbers, volume, length, and areas. Looking at them on 2D. Mere direct extrapolation from 2D to 3D will now work. Special technique and expertise are needed to do this, such as getting accurate numbers of nerves or cells or organs for that matter, or even the quantity of natural minerals in a particular region of the world. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I can confirm to you today that we not only have the expertise in the University of Lagos, we have the expert right here. 
institutions without stereologists. What have they been doing? Or what are they, do current, are they doing currently? What they are doing is to use formulas and geometry that we call the Euclidean geometry for naturally made objects. Unfortunately, as you can see here, there is no naturally made object that will ever fit in into this formula. And that is why a lot of the investigators in such universities, their results will be deviled by a lot of errors. Again, this is the brain. What previous authors who don't have, or universities that don't have sterilized, what, what do they do? They will use formulas meant for man-made objects, for natural objects. Again, of course, there is no brain, no, there is no structure in the human body that is exactly spherical. God has not created salt and will not ever create salt. Again, what are other devices doing? Using formulas also meant for cylinder, for example. This is probably only work in probably metallurgical engineering or chemical engineering, but of course not in biological sciences. Because there is no structure in the human body that will ever fit into this formula. What you need is stereology. Why must it be stereology, sir? Ladies and gentlemen, many investigators still use qualitative terms such as large, many, few, darker, lighter. These traditional approaches are often biased. In addition, calculating relative densities may not be representative of a wood structure. And some authors are thinking that errors will cancel out. Errors do not cancel out. Instead, errors are accentuated. What you need is stereology. Qualitative expression of morphological changes has limited sensitivity. For example, depending on tissue, magnitude of change must likely reach 40% before the pathologist could detect it. If subtle alterations in cell number are to be appreciated and reported, stereology is required. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of you could have done a lot of tests and the report of the kidney function probably within normal range. I am telling you today, even when close to 60% of your kidney is destroyed, the result will still come out as being normal range. Because that is the sensitivity of that test. However, if sterology is used, it is more sensitive than that. The same thing with the liver. The liver has the propensity to actually compensate a lot. Not until 80% of the liver is destroyed, your result will still come out as being within normal range. However, sterology will pick this up earlier enough. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. These are some of uh, my work in the field of stereology that have been published already. These are still some of them. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, a colleague of mine did a study recently trying to estimate the number of papers coming from Nigeria on stereology. Sir, I am glad, however, with a lot of humility that he found out that over half of this paper were coming from my lab. On the 23rd of April year 2015, I conducted the very first apometry evening in the world, whereby basic stereological techniques are taught using apple under a relatively informal setting. By the way, sir, Mr. Vice Chancellor, the word apometry is my calling, meaning teaching anatomy and sterology using apple. <laughs> I have been invited as international speaker at several conferences and workshops on stereology and morphometry. I was invited as a plenary speaker to the second Asian and African Stereology Congress in the United Arab Emirates. 
On the 8th of April 2016, I was in South Africa as a visiting scholar to present my work on stereology titled Numerical and Volumetric Estimation of Structure Using Unbiased Stereology. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, now my contributions on health education. Mr. Vice Chancellor, in my quest and passion for the good health of our people, I have articulated a 21-point action plan for the attainment and maintenance of perfect health. I have conducted several health seminars and enlightenment campaigns using this action plan against her, so as to be properly discharged and acquitted today without a fine. I will mention just a few, sir. The details are well documented in the booklet before you. Moreover, the author can be invited to make presentations anywhere in this universe. A major factor in wellness is self-appraisal. Self-appraisal allows you to personally assess if your daily lifestyle choices are setting you up for illness later in life. They may also be a rough estimate of your present state of wellness. In doing a self-appraisal, the individual will have to provide answers to the following questions I have labeled one to 12. All what you need to do is to score yourself one for any yes, zero for no, no negative marking here. <laughs> Love, association, and relationship. There is now evidence that what is experienced when we are in loving relationship involves various signaling molecules in our bodies that affect us systematically. Our nervous systems are no longer separate. They are no longer self-contained. As a matter of a right beginning from childhood, it is well documented that people who are close to us Without us knowing, they begin to affect us emotionally, psychologically. And our well-being is largely determined by who or what we associate with in life. Cheerfulness. Cheerfulness improves psychological well-being and health of our people. Happiness does not pro does happiness does protect against becoming ill. Happiness has good bearing on our health even on our life expectancy. Music. Music affects our well-being. The positive effect, in fact, it has been well documented that certain organs in the brain, especially those secreting the love hormone, like dopamine, like estrogen, well-being hormone, are actually stimulated by listening to good music. Therefore, in all things, be cheerful at all times. Be positive. Love all. Wish all well. And do no one no harm. Amuse yourself. Look into the mirror and see what you see. What do you see? Abraham, you are looking too serious today. Be cheerful. Amuse yourself. Clap, dance, and dance, and dance. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. The last work I will make to talk about here today before I leave is on Greater Tyon. Certainly not the least. First, my question to you out here today what do you consider the greatest problem of mankind, especially at the cellular level? If, I, you are, if you are giving the opportunity, you are probably going to tell me a lot of things. Some people will tell me spirituality. Some will tell me witches and wizards. But I'm telling you today, the greatest problem of this world are free radicals. If you are able to remove every molecule or atom of free radicals in the human body, you will live forever. But of course, you cannot do that. Ladies and gentlemen, at this stage, I like to distinguish between what I call chronological age and your cell age as a biologist. Many people 
their chronological ages are not in tandem with their cell age. Have you done noticed sometimes in the past, somebody asked you, how old are you? And you said, 20. Now, he said, you look like 30. Hey. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, hey. everyone develops from one single cell. Eventually to two cell state, to four cell state, to eight cell state, and eventually to 16 and to an adult. And then, in totality, we have over 70 trillions of cells. Out of this, we can divide them into 250 different types of cells. Every day of our life, we lose close to 300 billion of cells. And we must make back these 300 billion of cells every day. And one molecule that is engineering this is glutathione. There must be a balance between what is destroying the cell or what is creating free radical and your protectant. For example, this is what a normal cell looks like. By the way, every day of our life, every cell in the human body, the over 70 trillion of cells are being bombarded 10,000 times by a free radical. This has already been documented. Meaning that every day we live basically in the presence of free radical. And they, they've got to be contained. Some of the conditions that can increase your body of free radicals are so many. But I will quickly go through some of them. Our diet is very important. On healthy diet these days, that's, you know, sugars, sweeteners. Anyway, sweeteners are not better than sugars. They are all the same. There is no lesser evil here. Both are evil. <laughs> Again, salt is another thing we must watch out for. We must reduce our salt intake drastically. Salt checkers, are f salt checkers have been found in our homes. They have even become various ornaments at in our homes. With a lot, now we now decorate our tables with them. Ladies and gentlemen, the more you use salt checker, the more your life looks shaky. <laughs> salt checkers therefore must be removed from our homes. The next thing is stress. I'm sure some of us would have heard about Monday cardiac phenomena. We record a lot of cardiac phenomena, including heart attacks, usually on Monday. Well, because of stress, maybe the management will, not, will begin not to meet on Monday again. <laughs> Smoke. If I have the opportunity of asking my audience here, here today, how many people smoke? You will say, no, I'm not a smoker. But the truth in this present world is that all of us are smokers. It is not just about passive smoking alone. There are a lot of chemicals in the air. Over 70, over 7,000 tons of chemicals have been found in cigarette smoke alone. But that is not all. 80,000 industrial chemicals are circulating all over, in the soil, in water, everywhere. Unfortunately, many, many, many of these have never been tested for human toxicity. I doubt if the one in Ajota close to me have been tested. Wood smoke. Why am I talking about wood smoke here today? Because many of our people still exposed to, are still exposed to wood smoke. Unfortunately, wood smoke contains many of the same toxic chemicals and carcinogens that we find in cigarette smoke. As a matter of fact, wood smoke is worse than cigarette smoke. Exhaust from vehicles. This is where I say all of us, we are smokers. Driving a private car is a typical citizen's way of the most, of creating the greatest pollution this world has ever known. Especially those of us who sit in Odor, in Lagos, we are poisoned every day. What are, I'm going to mention cooking utensils. Aluminium is dangerous. Let's wash out. Use titanium instead. Take away pack. Let's be watchful because <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, some chemicals are released gradually 
when food has served us in this. The best way to teach you our mom is to live. These are highly dangerous. Any, anytime anybody serves you hot water for your tea, please ask. Is it a plastic container? Do you have plastic within it? Cross check. Because biscuit on A and the exit are just been moved from casino game group A, group B to group A. Meaning that it's no longer an association no, between this and plastic. It is a cosmetic agent. <laughs> Radiation is all over. Recently, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, the geographers have just told us that the geomagnetic effects within the earth core has undergone a reduction that they are expecting in 200 years. They find that it has occurred in 20 years. What are the effects of this ge geographic effect? The geomagnetic effect of the earth. The geomagnetic effect of the earth actually reflects dangerous areas from the cosmic onto us. With this reduction, sir, what it means, therefore, invariably, that all these dangerous rays, including the earth ultraviolet rays, are actually bombarding humans now. No wonder, therefore, we are beginning to see in increase in incidence of cancer. There may be the association. Microwaves are equally dangerous. Phones are dangerous. Cell phones, cell sites are dangerous. As a matter of fact, sir, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, we are now living in a toxic world. What then is the solution? Glitter tion. You must raise it. Most powerful and transient, only lantern that replenishes itself, it recycles itself, its mother of all lantern, you must just find a way of raising your level of glitter tion. By the way, at about the age of 20, you see what happens to your glitter tion level? The level drops. And at a, by, meaning that by the time you are living, you are about 50 years of age, your glutathione would have gone drastically low. As a matter of fact, by the time I have practiced for just 10 years as a medical doctor, I was beginning to be afraid of getting old. <laughs> Why? Because almost every patient I've ever seen at the age of 50 were coming down with one problem or the other. Scientists have discovered that. I'm, that all what you need to do now is to raise the glutathione level. A lot of diseases have been associated with low level of glutathione. Therefore, it becomes very important. All what you need to do, raise the glutathione level. Of, unfortunately, and I will tell you our experience in my lab now before I run down. It is not easy raising the level of glutathione. Glutathione is made up of three amino acids. Glutamic acid, Glycine and sustain. But thank God for humans, two of these components we have in our body, in our body. And therefore, all what you need to do is to supply sustain. Once you have the sustain, you can make as much glutathione as possible. And what we have done in our lab is that we have used D ribose L sustain giving us a combination of ribosine, and once ribosine gets inside the blood, cysteine is released, and as many molecules as possible of glutathione can be made. And we have published a lot of work on this. This actually can be found online. And lastly, sir, Mr. Vice Chancellor, my contributions in the area of mentorship, capacity development, and academic scholarship. I have traveled to every state in Nigeria Organizing trainings and capacity development seminars. I have been involved in the training of endocrinologists in Nigeria. Senior registrars in endocrinology are required to go through a two-week rotation in comparative endocrinology in my laboratory. A program that is largely in the use of and handling of animals. I have conducted several workshops on scientific paper writing testicular toxicology and experimental diabetology. I have trained several MSc students and have successfully graduated 12 PhD students. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, 
One of them is already a professor. Four are associate professors. And many are senior lecturers. And they are doing very well, both within the country and outside the country. In 2013, sir, I was invited by the federal government to run a workshop on the prevention of crony diseases and prevention of sodium health for all federal permanent secretaries in Nigeria. I did the same thing in Durban and then in Johannesburg. And this is an oncoming one. And this was what a communique of one of our endocrine meetings. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, at the June 2017, I have, as at June 2017, I have published 103 scientific papers. I have also authored two textbooks of anatomy, one on gross anatomy and the other on histology, commonly described by the students as the Bible of histology. And I am the, a co-author of the first national clinical practice guidelines for diabetes management in Nigeria. My recommendation, sir. Special attention and incentives must be given to be given to anatomists, technologists, and all members of the department exposed to formalin, a carcinogen. The university should establish a sterology laboratory. This will in no time, sir, be self-sustained and capable of generating funds for the university. Case-based learning should be adopted as the major mode of knowledge transmission in all educational institutions in Nigeria. Efforts should be geared towards reduction of pollution in our, on our campuses. Vehicles with visible emissions should no longer be allowed to enter our university. In addition, sir, massive enlightenment campaign on using simple gas-saving strategies should be undertaken. Earth enlightenment talks and stress management, sir, is advocated for all staff, including the university management. And it should be periodical. Mm -hmm. Lastly, sir, sales side of communication companies should be properly located at safe distances. And as a matter of fact, I'm advocating immediate health assessment studies on the impact of cell sites for those of us living near cell sites on this campus. In conclusion, sir, Mr. Vice Chancellor, there is a great difference between literal or dictionary definition of anatomy and anatomy as a discipline. Anatomy as a discipline is beyond studying just structure or dissection of cadavers. We have gone beyond that. Human anatomy is the scientific study of form and structure and how this relates to functions. Just like oxygen is ubiquitous in living organisms and it is essential to life, anatomy is also ubiquitous and absolutely essential in science, medicine and everyday living. I have contributed my own quota and we continue to do so in the areas of chronobiology, endocrinology, abology, medical education, cellular and environmental toxicology, reproductive health, stereology, health education, mentorship and capacity development. In all these areas, sir, I have remained an anatomist and indeed anatomist for life and forever. Despite my specialization in reproductive and endocrine anatomy, sub-specialization in microscopic anatomy, and sub-sub-sub-specialization in stereology. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, my gratitude. I had the opportunity as expressively presented his novel lecture titled The Anatomist. Jack of all trades, master of all. I think you are the one that can judge whether it's a master of all here. <laughs> the inaugural lecturer works in anatomy 
has helped us to better understand the fundamental working of biological entity in terms of how the cellular mechanisms regulate functions in health and disease. In this lecture, Professor Ashimubi stated how his work or his works has over the 15 years increased human knowledge about diabetes which affects blood sugar regulation and its management. In 2002, Professor Shubi convincingly demonstrated that blood, sugar, blood glucose level varies along with the internal biological clock in rat models in Lagos. This demonstration gave credence to the knowledge required in understanding many aspects of human lifestyle and disease management. And due to the importance of his contribution in this field, he was appointed as one of the experts to draft the first guidelines for diabetes management in Nigeria. In other work, which was in understanding the male productive biology, that work has expanded previous and current knowledge in the field as well. Professor Shinobi also showed us data in some of the work that revealed the, that PSA, phosphate, phosphate antigen, may be more than a tumor marker. This was clearly showed that the serum level of PSA correlates positively with serum in the in Nigerian males. He explained how this information is important in policy management, as you can get that in the report. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Abraham Adewali Adepunjo shouldn't be now that you have successfully paid your academic debt to the University of Lagos. <laughs> in today's very informative and exciting inaugural lecture, which has immense contribution on improving our world on behalf of Senate of the University of Lagos, you are here by the study and people. I therefore welcome you to the committee of professors that have paid their dues. Congratulations. We want to urge you to continue to mentor those after you and continue to contribute positively to academics and research in the University of Lagos. Let me, at this juncture, thank the audience here today and particularly the University community for all your support during my tenure and to say that the Lecture Lecturer Series has now been formalized and are contributing mostly to changing our world. Your presence at these local lectures are making the differences because you transmit this over to others that are not here. And we are also made it a point of duty to send copies of one of our lectures to all the government agencies that are, have the relevance to it. That way, one day somebody will pick up and be able to utilize it for the benefit of the nation. I want to thank you all for coming to this, and I urge you to continue to attend the lectures and support the University of Lagos in the years ahead. Thank you very much. <laughs>